So welcome back. Hopefully you got a chance to watch that video and hopefully YouTube doesn't take it down. Um, it's a great video that addresses not only the experiences of the Middle Passage, but also gives you some very kind of great information. Um, if, if you don't see the video, that means that probably YouTube took it out, right? So it's a, I think it was a short video. So let's continue by looking at, um, you know, this movement from the African continent to the Caribbean. Right here you see a map of how people are migrating to different parts of, of um, the Americas. So the Caribbean became a, an important center for this um, movement of people. <clears throat> the Caribbean was an important center uh, as most slaves would arrive here first and because of the plantations of sugar, tobacco, and cotton. These became major industries. Um, you know, the, the reading talks about the movement of goods from the Americas to Europe, right? Uh, so we find that many of these people uh, that were working this territory, um, you know, many of them end up dying, not only on the way here, but also once they do arrive because they're coming into a new environment. It is noted that about 30% died during what was called the seasoning period. Seasoning is, is an idea of basically acclimating and assimilating uh, African people into the slave system. The more seasoned you are, the more value you have. Um, it is important to note that uh, many of these workers uh, worked all, all day, about 18 hour work days only getting about two breaks, one a 30 minute break and maybe a, another two hour break uh, during sometimes the hottest part of the day. And if you've ever been to Caribbean, right, it's very humid, very hot, um, you know, it takes its, its toll on you. We find that pregnant women would work all day, all the way up to delivery. So, you know, if, you know, they, if, if you're part of the system, you're considered property and they could essentially work you to death. Uh, this kind of goes back to this notion that we talked at the beginning with looking at Michel Foucault's theory of power and hegemony, right? Because we find that the majority of the population are not European, but either indigenous communities or African peoples, some, some of them mixed. And the question always arises, well, why didn't they just, you know, revolt? Many of us say, well, if I was back then, you know, I would, I would have revolted. And it's like, mm, slow down there, cowboy. You know, most of these people... Um, didn't because the Europeans established a system that is conditioning them to accept their status as in, in servitude, right? This is, you know, the institution of slavery is essentially that, right? It's an institution where you begin to accept it. That's what hegemony does, right? It makes you believe that this system is real and that you really cannot question it. So there are uprisings. I'm not going to say there was none. Um, but uh, to some extent, people begin to accept this system. And remember that this is a form of what we would call chattel slavery. Very different from uh, other historical periods of, of slavery for the most part. As we talk with Mesoamerica and then even in Africa and even in Europe, right? Most of those uh, slave systems were temporary. You could buy your way out if you if you wanted to. Um, by the 1700s, it becomes an institution. We'll dig a little bit deeper, particularly when we talk about the the, the colonies. All right. So in this new world, and here we're kind of focusing on on Mexico. Um, once the Spanish colonized Mesoamerica, uh, I think I mentioned this in in um, uh, a while before that. We see many kind of aristocratic um, indigenous communities intermarry with the uh, Spanish. The Spanish didn't bring too many women, unlike the American model, uh, sorry, the British model, where you see more uh, families coming over in this um in the Spanish uh, version, you don't really see that. You see them mixing in with the local population, as I talked about Cortez and La Malinche, right? Um, but there is still a hierarchy being established here. <clears throat> so um, it's, it's, it's a much more complicated one than the American um, model of race, but it's still a racial system. So in Mexico, 
the, they established something called Regime de Castas, and it's basically a caste system. Um, as in the intro, I showed you that background picture that had all these numbers and all these names. It's a very complex system that as more people mix, they need to establish more categories. The theory behind the caste system was really to clean your blood. It's called the limpieza de sangre. The more European you are, the better off you're going to be. The, the system basically determined your status in the new world. You know, the less indigenous, obviously the less black blood you have, the better off you were going to be. Is it a guarantee? No. But for the most part, those who were lighter skin control the system. I mean, if in certain, um, certain castes, uh, you couldn't even, um, you know, run for governor or go, go get an education or entry, enter certain guilds. So opportunities were close to you depending on the category of your, of your caste. Sorry, there's a, a lot of jets always flying over here. Um, so here you see probably the most common, which is the mestizo, a, a Spaniard with an indigenous woman produces um, a mestizo, right? And then more than likely they would want him to marry somebody of Spanish blood um, and then a category would be created for them like a castizo or something like that, right? Um, and then at the bottom of this kind of caste system is where you have you know darker bloods. And what you see is that as you're going lower in these categories, the names begin to kind of insinuate this kind of devolution. There's names like lobos and coyotes and, and a few other terms that are, are somewhat degrading. So they, by creating a system such as this, it creates opportunities for some while limiting uh, opportunities for the majority, all right? And, and again, it, it's kind of being tied into this concept of race, that there's something in your blood that just makes you better, right? If you were from Spain, then for whatever reason, you were seen as superior. You were also seen as white. As I noted at the beginning that it's, you know, the Moors, the um, um, you know, Islamic people uh, ruled Spain. So you do have some mixing happening in Spain. So um, to say that Spanish were white, uh, that's, you know, it doesn't really kind of make sense when they were mixing with other communities. But as they're moving to the Americas, they begin to see themselves as white, as superior as these other populations. All right. Um, I did read um, that uh, you could buy your way into some of these castas, like you can move up if you want to, but this is like much later as the system is um, kind of coming apart. And really by the, I believe by the 18th century, you can't manage the system anymore. It, it, it gets so ridiculous because every time people mix, you have to create new categories. Um, it collapses onto itself. Uh, eventually, it's just mestizo becomes the dominant territories. But if you ever go to Mexico, there's certain places where you see a lot of kind of African people, uh, like darker skin. Places like Acapulco um, is, is, is a common place. Um, maybe more kind of southern um, Mexico. And it's because these were ports, and that's where you see, um, you know, that African influence in, in, um, in uh, places like Mexico. Uh, so the Spanish begin to control Mexico, but again, our, our kind of goal is to move north, right? So you do begin to see migration to northern New Spain. Remember that the Southwest was controlled by Spain. So the movement north was based on part. Um, uh, to the stories that De Vaca told about, uh, was told about these towns made of gold. Remember that Cortes, when he arrived to Tenochtitlan in central Mexico, he found gold. I mean, there's so much gold there. It's, it's, it was ridiculous, which, you know, they kind of had dropped their jaws. <clears throat> so um, these stories of gold uh, were continuously told. So to some extent, maybe get the people out of their region so they can continue somewhere else. So there was actually an expedition uh, by Friar Marcos de Nisa, who was a Franciscan uh, friar, or he's Catholic, and he who went to investigate um, these stories, which actually spurred three major expeditions. In 1540, Vasquez uh, 
de Coronado traveled through the Sonoran Desert into Arizona and New Mexico, failing to find any gold. I think a lot of times they're just kind of pushing them to continue um, elsewhere, uh, particularly native populations. The Sunni people persuaded them to continue north into modern day Kansas. So we see that um, Spanish people kind of traveled all the way up to, you know, deep into um, um, Middle America. Another expedition was by Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, who traveled up the coast of California, who ended up dying in Santa Barbara, but his expedition ended in Oregon. So we see Spanish settlements moving their way into what is today the Southwest, into Arizona, into New Mexico, into um, California, right? In New Mexico, a settlement was established with an encomienda system where native peoples were exploited and quote unquote civilized. Um, <clears throat> so as they're moving to the American Southwest, a lot of these expedition leaders are influenced by the idea of La Reconquista, that Spanish reconquest against the Moors. Um, and they were influenced by the Spanish treatment of the Moors, right? Remember that they were basically kicked out of Iberia if they did not convert. So the missionary uh, mindset created a rationale for the many atrocities Native Americans were subjected to throughout Spain's American territories. Um, we, it, it's, it's a very kind of tragic story. Again, my women's history, we talked about what happens to Native women in California. Many of them are being um, uh, sexually abused. Um, uh, even though they're trying to force them to convert into Christianity, the actions that are being done to them don't make sense in the context of Christianity, right? Because they're telling, you know, save your virginity, yet here you are being raped. Um, so uh, very contradictory messages that they're receiving from, from um, these quote-unquote explorers. Um, so the treatment of Native American people, again, is just horrendous of what's happening here. Um, we find that Native people were seen as quote-unquote hijos de Dios, so they thought that they can save their souls and that they were redeemable. And again, this is you know where we see a lot of mixing happening, right? Uh, whereas in the British uh, model, we find that there wasn't a lot of mixing because the English saw native people as savages. Yeah. Um, in the North, which is to the, you know, the American Southwest today, um, the Spanish North, the mission system prevailed with small populations. Uh, we see probably no more than 5,000 uh, people living in, in certain territories. Uh, and this, um, unlike in central Mexico, where you have a very strong casta system, right, where people kind of know their place, we find that in central uh, northern Spain, the casta system um, was a lot, a lot more blurry, uh, blurred, uh, causing the system to become muddled and largely ineffective. This allowed for social mobility of different people, particularly those of mixed heritage. Uh, this helped create an, a communal society in the Southwest, even in places like Texas, African descendants who migrated there were able to be part of the community. We find that in places like California and, and um, Arizona and, and, and Texas, that um, they're actually sending people, <laughs> some of them were criminals, uh, others were just kind of vagabonds who were kind of taking up space, being lazy or whatever. And it's like, you know, go north, you can settle, you can get territory there. Uh, you know, territory that were being taken away from the native population. So there, the casta system wasn't as prevalent as it was in central Mexico. So you do see a lot more mixing. And again, it's, it's going back to the idea of power and hegemony. It's not like a melting pot. It's just... You know, it's horrendous. As I said, Native women were being raped. Um, uh, so you have the product of that rape, right, with people coming to you know, different uh, ethnicities, right? We find that Jewish people actually migrated to the Americas. Uh, remember that they're being kicked out of Spain. Many of them, some of them went to Israel. Other, others went to other parts of Europe. Uh, but some of them came to the Americas. So uh, Jewish uh, come converts 
some of them ended up moving to New Mexico because res restrictions were not strongly held there. So some of them, um, so we see in the Southwest as much uh, as a much more complex than other parts of the world when it came to to race. Part of it had to do with the people who migrated there along with the need for labor. However, there was still a power structure that was based on class, family, and kinship. So, you know, families, uh, not families, but people who migrated to places like um, Texas and, and, and New Mexico and, and California had a little bit of more freedom than uh, people who were migrating to, say, central Mexico. As I said, the Jewish converts, they could still practice their faith without there being too much trouble, unlike, you know, they couldn't do that in places like Iberia, right? So the Southwest, uh, again, we don't want to call it a mix, what is it, uh, a melting pot, but you do see a lot of people coexisting. Certain people having mobility at different times, but again, there's still issues there because certain people were not accepted, such as native people. So <clears throat> let's talk about this issue of, um, of race and the way it, it, it kind of develops in places like the East Coast of the United States. So we talked about, again, that movement north from Mesoamerica into the modern day Southwest. Now we're going back to the East Coast and looking at how um, we go from a system of slavery where there are time periods where again people might have been able to obtain freedom to it really being institutionalized and becoming more or less more or less racialized all right so we're going to look at religion and slavery here so the the construction of race is a very complicated system with european powers taking different positions at different times so there is not one narrative of how slave and race kind of works in, in the Americas. Um, I hope to present an overall picture um, of this system of slavery and how it develops. However, understand that it will be very general as each region differed and needs its own in-depth examination to understand how concepts of race develop in the colonies. Uh, the common theme that we can agree is that Europeans did see native and African people as inferior by nature and I kind of talked about how why there wasn't a lot of mixing um, you know like them intermarrying into these different communities the church did address um, that it was illegal to enslave another uh, Christian uh, this actually goes back to about the 14th or 15th century actually um, <clears throat> so if you were Christian they could not you cannot be enslaved because you're you're a Christian and even Queen Isabella sought the protection and conversion of native people. However, slavery still continued, but this idea of someone being Christian would play a role in the construction of race. One place where we see it is this concept of the black legend. The story goes that, um, um, you know, native, as I mentioned earlier, native people were treated horribly and Dominican um, friar Bartolome de las Casas critiqued the enslavement of native people and, and critiqued the abuse that they were encountering. Here you see the legend of the, uh, the, the black legend, right? Of the way um, native people were being treated. Um, Juan de Sepulveda, uh, who wrote his essay, quote, they are slaves by, by nature, unquote, justified their bondage by using social Darwinist arguments such as the inferiority um, due to them native people losing the war, their cultural and religious differences. So it was comparing native culture with Christian culture. Obviously, Sepulveda is arguing that European culture is superior. <laughs> I mean, he's a little bit biased there, right? Uh, and also comparing their physical characteristics that was tied to labor um, because of, you know, saying like, well, they're naturally born this way to do this type of work, which helped create this idea of difference and inferiority. 
right? So this, the Sepulveda kind of helped justify why native people should be treated as second-class citizens. Uh, de la Casa has tried to protect them. Though de la Casa has argued for the protection of native people, we do find a lot more intermixing in the Americas. Um, Protestants would actually use the story of the black legend, the story that de la Casa uh, use in order to critique the Spanish and justify the English treatment of people of color. So in, um, in Mesoamerica, we do find mixing. Um, we do see this push towards trying to incorporate them. But in the end, we do see the Spanish seeing native people as inferior. And, uh, you know, the English people are, to some extent, have some of the same ideas. Again, this is why history is so complicated. Because sometimes we, as historians, we look at law codes and it's like, well, there's no racial system being characterized at this particular period, so we think things were equal. And th they weren't, right? There's definitely like social history. Uh, we could look at law. You know, we could look at these different things. And, um, you know, sometimes people kind of create history. Um, when it comes to slave codes, uh, people of color quickly outnumbered Europeans in the Americas. So, for example, in Jamaica, the slave population was at 200,000, while whites only accounted for about 18,000 by the 18th century. This fear helped create a system of slave codes to maintain uh, the European power. In England, they passed the, quote, Act to Regulate the Negroes on the British Plantation, uh, unquote which described them as wild, barbarous, and savage uh, nature to be controlled only with strict severity and forbid them from leaving the plantation without a pass or carrying any weapons. They could be whipped to death if their master wished. So again, from a social perspective, we see how Europeans are seeing people of color as second-class citizens. we find that in, in regards to these slave codes, often the condition of servitude was rooted through the legal status of the mother, such as the French slave codes of 1685. Now this is significant because in Western culture, right, European culture, we are very patriarchal society, right? Very male dominated society. And we always go through the male line. I mean, back then when people got married, the wife would take the husband's name, right? They always wanted a male heir, right? Um, so these, these concepts of patriarchy all of a sudden did not apply to people of color. It's not coincidental, right? By going through the mother line, so if, you, if your mother was a slave, in other words, this is what this law is saying, then your status follows the status of your mother. This sounds almost way too convenient, right? when your entire ideology is based on patriarchy, always going through male lines, all of a sudden you switch it to focus on um, the condition of, of your mother. So we see, uh, again, this concept of hegemony and power shifting at this particular moment. When it comes to uh, the black status in, West, in the West Atlantic region, so this is basically the colonies, African people have a long have a long established history in what is today the United States. In 1526, they helped establish the San Miguel de Guadalupe um, uh, community in Georgia. They traveled to, Tam uh, to Tampa Bay and St. Augustine providing the labor needed to build the outpost. So African people, right, black people were instrumental in building uh, you know, different places in, in you know, what becomes the United States. In the British colonies, many African people came as slaves from the African continent. In the 16th century, in, the British, um, in British colonies, there were no laws that required slaves to be chattel uh, to be held in, in perpetual hereditary bondage. No records show that they were property and were listed in the census in 1623 as servants. Records in Virginia show that there were a number of free blacks able to own land, such as Anthony Johnson. So early in the our, our, our history, we find that chattel slavery really didn't take root, but things 
would change. And, and again, the example of Anthony Johnson, you know, being a free person and having territory. So a lot of people go to these examples and say, yeah, oh, you see, things were not as bad. And it's like, well, mm, they only get worse, right? So we have uh, really after, you know, the, the 16th century, the establishment of, of uh, institutional uh, slavery and really, um, to some extent, racism. That doesn't mean that didn't exist before. So we have to be careful, um, though, by not diluting the black experience through these anecdotal evidence. And that is key, because a lot of times we like to use anecdotal evidence to justify our way of thinking. Though people are tempted to compare indentured servitude with slavery, uh, they were distinctly very different. For example, in 1640, Virginia, where two white and one black servant ran away, the two white servants got an extra year added to their contract, while the black servant, John Punch, had to remain a slave for the rest of his life. Right. So a lot of people again use indentured servitude as well. That's a that's kind of like slavery. It's not. Um, I mean, they were they had contracts, right? They could take people to court if they needed to. A slave could not. And by this time, it's you know when we're talking about slave, we're really referring to people. Uh, to black people, right? African uh, peoples. In New York, which at this time was um, controlled by the, by the Dutch, uh, we see an important uh, an importation of slaves due to the lack of white indentured servants. Um, slaves became an important community being able to serve in the militia, worship in the, in the Dutch Reformed Church, and seek legal redress, along with being able to marry. So again, so we have an example of what happens with British. We have an example here with the Dutch. You know, um, as agricultural production increased, conditions worsened for slaves. In the 1680s, with the English in control of New, of New York, they discouraged owners from freeing their slaves as manumission began to disappear. Manumission basically is this idea of, you know, obtaining your freedom. So once the English begin to take over New York, all of a sudden the system changes. Whereas the Dutch, not to say it was any better, but had a certain, um, where uh, slaves have certain abilities, that begins to disappear once the British take over. In Massachusetts, slavery was instituted in the 1630s. Um, and in Massachusetts specifically, uh, though anybody could be enslaved, uh, whether you were white, native, or black, we find that uh, after 1670, uh, the majority of people, um, if not all, were African. And also it became hereditary, where you're basically born into slavery. Again, this is something that's new um, in more or less kind of world history. By the 1660s, slave codes became racialized uh, much, uh, much, much more such as um, arguing that slave status followed the status of the mother, which I already talked about. Uh, for example, in 1662 in Virginia, uh, Virginia law, code, law declared that the free or slave status of children born in the colon colony would depend on the condition of their mother. So the slave mother will equal a slave child. By 1667, another law was added to remove any opportunity to gain freedom based on religious grounds. So a lot of times people, as I noted earlier, say, well, I'm Christian, you can't enslave, enslave another Christian. So basically what happened in Virginia is that they did away with that, saying, no, you can be Christian and you can be enslaved. And again, this is really for African people. In Maryland, uh, Maryland also implemented such laws, even outlawing marriage between slaves and freeborn English women. <clears throat> So basically maintaining ideas of blackness and racial inferiority. In Virginia, particularly after Bacon's rebellions, laws supported punitive measures against African descent people for robbing such as 60 lashes, you know, 16 whippings, uh, and have their ears cut off. Acts of associating with white and free blacks called for whippings, for branding, or for maiming. Uh, <clears throat> every white person um, in Maryland had the right and responsibility to police, police the slave population. 
So now, uh, again, this becomes a system where you're, uh, if you're a white settler, um, you're part of that process now, right? Uh, that you have the right to police the slave population. To question black people who are just maybe walking about, right? <clears throat> By 1680, white Virginians began to feel like they were uh, outnumbered and passed laws banning slaves from freedom of assembly, their right to carry weapons, and freedom from movement without a certificate from a master um, from the plantation they came from. So as we move forward, movement of African peoples would become much more restricted. So ultimately, what we see is, again, this is just, believe it or not, this is a short lecture, even though it might seem kind of long, um, but we're trying to cover a lot here, right? Where, you know, how did we get from people having these conflicts based off religion in places like the Iberian Peninsula to all of a sudden people of color being second class people, right? And, and not only second class, but it's also a legal form, right? Um, where it becomes um, institutionalized through law codes, but also racialized. And this is what we kind of try to show you um, in uh, you know, looking at some of these stories and these uh, slave codes that are here. Like I said earlier, you know, we, we, we do offer classes on, on uh, African American history, uh, Native American history, um, women's history. Um, I teach, you know, U.S. history and, and you know, uh, talk about working class history too. So you, we can always dig a lot deeper in many of these subjects that I covered, but you know, I, I am trying to present um, some kind of major arguments in the way we teach American history. Um, lecture. Um, as I try to teach you uh, in this particular lecture, I'm sorry it's so long, but there's a lot to cover. And even then, we haven't covered everything. So history, uh, particularly U.S. history, is not just a movement from east to west, right? From England to the British colonies to the West Coast. Um, our history, American history, it's one where you have the movement of people from different parts of the world, but also geographically speaking. Um, you know, the start of the United States can start at any different point uh, as we see the movement from Mexico into uh, what is now the U.S., um, the, the Southwest, or movement into places like Florida and Georgia before the British colonists even arrived to the East Coast. So our history is very complex. Uh, since we have been told typically one narrative, which is that British um, to the British colonies narrative, anything that kind of goes against that, we feel as though it challenges you know, the, the way we, we have been taught U.S. history, but it also you know, makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable because then we have to acknowledge the presence of other people before the British even arrived to the colonies as, you know, there were already communities um, in places like California and our own very state, right, Arizona, that predate uh, 1619. Number two, our history is one of clash, right? One of mixing, one of power, and one of codification. As I try to show you that it's a very complex history and I'm trying to cover it in a very short period of time. This is something that we can spend an entire semester in, but um, I try to hit some of the major points. It's not an us versus them narrative, particularly with the example of Mexico, right? That you see a lot of mixing, you see the Spanish and you know the native arist uh, arist aristocracy coming together and you know they have something to lose too if, if you know they don't buy into this new system so you know they you, you have the emergence of this concept that I, I provided called mestizaje right so there you know our, our, our history is one that is intertwined with many narratives many stories right and often contradictory we do have stories of for example um Native people owning slaves, right? And a lot of times we get hung up on that. Understand that, uh, as I try to show you at the you know, previous slide, that uh, 
eventually it's really the British colonists um, and you know these kind of European laws that come in and really begin to set this idea of chattel slavery where you're born into slavery right so I, I don't want you to get so attached to anecdotal um, type of evidence and you know be very selective when you do this and then say well you see they did it too and, and it's not that simple as I try to show you how systems of slavery were different in places like Africa and Mesoamerica um, and when the Europeans go into these places it completely changes it so um, as a historian uh, a lot of times people and I'm, by people I mean the general public get hung up on on these anecdotal uh, evidence which really kind of you know, doesn't really do history justice in other words uh, and then lastly um, the last couple slides I, I try to really show you how by the 16th and 17th century we do begin to see a system of what we now call race so I started all the way back to the uh, Reconquista and ended it around the 1700s and it's a process right so you're never going to get a definitive date as to when this concept of race begins because there is none however the majority of scholars and I think almost all scholars have noted that race becomes a thing by the uh, 1500s 1600s and particularly with laws and and the slave trade we see concepts of race of, of race really get cemented and as I try to show you that in Mesoamerica um, it's a little bit more complicated you know different I, I guess is a better word than say in places like the British colonies where in Mesoamerica by no means is it any better right because it's still hierarchical Europeans are still at the very top if you can prove that you have quote unquote European blood you're going to be better off um, in this caste system the casta system uh, and if you look at the American model there you have the one drop theory right where if you have one 32nd of, uh, of uh, African blood right quote unquote then you're considered or you could be defined as as a black so um, it does show you at the very least that race is a very complex system and um, hopefully you continue taking classes on these subjects as you move on and you know th there's just so much more you could take sociology courses too and they dig into some of these subjects deeper as I said at the beginning of this lecture some of this material does come from um, some of the great scholars um, that I where I went to school at UC Santa Barbara all right so we'll stop it there and um, hope you feel like you learned something